Good morning, everyone. I'm Joe Flick with the State Library, and I'm here with my colleague Suzanne Reimer, who's going to be conducting our webinar this morning. So, Suzanne, take it away. Good morning. I'm Suzanne Reimer, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm a statewide consulting librarian with the Montana State Library. And um, one of the reasons, well, first of all, I want to give you a caveat that this is going to be basic information because we only have an hour. And I'm assuming that most of you don't have a whole lot of networking experience. Um, if you do, then great. You can help correct me when I'm wrong. But um, when I started off at the State Library, I was hired as a, a technology librarian. So I did a bit of this early on. Um, but then my job changed. And so this is actually kind of out of the purview of my job at this point. So. Um, I don't do heavy duty networking things, but it is involved with things like um, filtering and DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act stuff. And I'm always really interested in library security issues. So that's kind of where I'm coming at from this. And I thought um, it would be a good opportunity to hopefully get people thinking a little bit about you know, your library networks, how they're set up, um, if you haven't, you know, go in and check out your routers and get familiar with what's in there and what they can do and what they can't do, that kind of thing, and um, and kind of and check out network traffic to see what's going on and maybe look for potential problems and um, see how your bandwidth is, whether it's meeting the need or if you're kind of hitting up about the um, the top of what you can really handle at this point. So um, thought I'd start off with a little bit of finding out who's there, because some of you I know, some of you I don't. Um, question, how many of you have already set up um, home or library networks that you think so? You can just put a little something in there about chat if, you, you know, if you've already done some of this. And then, you know, second question is, um, you know, who feels comfortable checking the settings and getting reports from their routers? And um, and then, you know, finally, how many of you are here primarily for information on subnetworks? So just to find out a little bit about where you guys are at. And um, I can go ahead and unmute everybody's mic right away. And that way, if you do have a microphone, you can just speak. Oops. So I see that Mary Kay says that at her library in Colstrip that she, her technology person has set some things up. And Janine Brookie says, my tech set up the library's network. She doesn't know anything about it. <laughs> I bet you're not alone, Janine. That's a good opportunity to learn something about it. So anyone else want to jump in while mics are open? I see Stefan is here. Stefan, your microphone is muted on your end. Um, where do That's you fit? Right. Where do you fit in that? In this, um, the answer to these questions. So our library uh, is set up through the, our techno, our tech people. Um, I do have one at home, and I don't think I've ever gotten reports out of my router, but I think I could kind of dig in there a little bit. Okay. Yeah, And then also in the chat box, Yvonne has said that she set up networks and knows how to check settings, but doesn't know how to get reports from the router. Okay. I honestly didn't even know you could get reports from the router before well, you just asked that question. <laughs> so. Well, it depends somewhat on the router. So um, I, I assume most of them would give you some kind of reports, but we'll, we'll look into that a little bit. Hold on a second. I'm going to mute everybody and I'll be right back with you unmuted. Suzanne, hold on. Okay, you're good to go. And I did want to check on the subnetworks because um, since we're doing, you know, a real introduction, we're not going to get into that a whole lot because that tends to get into a whole nother level of switches and all kinds of good stuff like that. Um, a little quick intro so we know what we're talking about with some of the common networking devices. Um, you know, first of all, you're going to have a modem, a broadband modem, um, which will generally be either for cable or DSL. Um, one 
caveat here is uh, make sure that your modem supports um, the speeds that your ISP claims to be providing. As they're increasing their speeds, the old modems don't necessarily um, keep up with that. So often you'll need to get your modem replaced in order to take advantage of those higher speeds. And this is something that's happening across the state, specifically with charter spectrum. Um, you know, because, and this was something that I noticed for, you know, my own home network. You know, they were advertising, you know, minimum speeds of 60 megabits, and they were, they were going up to 100. And you know, I went and checked mine, and mine was like 30. And I went, hmm, what's up with that? So I spent a whole lot of time on hold, so I can save you the trouble of having to do that to talk to um, tech support, and found out that, oh, gosh, my old modem wouldn't support you know, up to 60 megabits. So I had to replace the modem. And you know, if you have a um, if you have a store, one of their stores nearby, you can just trade them out. You know, bring in your old one; they'll give you a new one, or you can buy one if you want. Um, but as the speeds increase, a lot of times the old equipment isn't going to keep up with it. And you'll see that as we go through a whole bunch of this stuff. Um, some of the one, some of the modems that are provided by ISPs also include routers and wireless routers. Um, Router is often a separate device, and it can be wired or wireless. The wireless ones often have those weird little antennas sticking off of them, and their job is to forward data packets between um, computers, between basically the computer, um, between the computers on the, between the computers on your network and um, the outside. And wireless routers are often not just the router, they also include firewalls and access points. Um, you'll have networking cables, at least to connect up your router to your modem. And oftentimes we'll have some of our computers in the library also hooked up, we call it to ethernet. And so um, there'll be cables running. And in the olden days, and still what I have most of are Cat5 cables. Um, Cat5 cables supported speeds between 10 and 100 megabits. Um, now they're moving up to Cat5e and Cat6 to support higher bandwidth on your networks. Cat5e supports up to 1 gig. Cat6 supports up to 10 gigs. Um, so do you have to up, you know, do you have to replace all of these? right now? Um, probably not. If, you're, um, if your bandwidth out to the internet still isn't over 100, um, you can probably continue to get by with Cat5. Um, you know, as you get up, you know, to 100, um, those of you, and I don't think anybody on here has a gig connection, but some of our libraries have gig connections. Um, they'll probably be wanting to run Cat5e um, if if you want really high bandwidth within your library, like if you're running um, a video server or something, and, or, you know you might want higher bandwidth and you want a faster um, faster networking cables on that. But um, start looking at potentially having to replace those as well. Um, access points can be part of your router, or they can be separate and their purpose is to broadcast the Wi-Fi signal. Um, a firewall is um, a networking security system that monitors and controls incoming and outgoing networking traffic. And um, generally, you set some security rules on that. Now, that can be part, like I said, it can be part of your router. Often, they are built in to that is just software. It can also be a separate device. So those of you who've had sonic walls before. Um, sonic walls are, they're generally a little bit more than that, but they're, um, they contain a firewall as well. And then finally, there's hubs and switches. Um, we used to use hubs a lot more, and basically, you know, it was just like this little contraption, contraption that you plugged a bunch of cables in, and it connected um, the devices together. Um, Switches were a lot more expensive, but 
the nice thing about switches is they're also more sophisticated and so they kind of keep track of what's going back and forth and um, what are the devices on the network so it knows where to ship it to whereas hubs just kind of randomly went well, you know we got this information you know anybody want it and the computer that needed it had to go and claim it um, so it was a little bit random but it worked in smaller networks um, some common networking terms that you hear thrown around all the time IP addresses um, each device on a network will have an IP address and it's a bunch of numbers we'll see them in a few minutes um, they can be static or fixed which means you, know, you set it and it doesn't change or it can be dynamic and so it'll change periodically um, DHCP is a protocol that assigns addresses to devices as needed it assigns IP addresses to devices as needed um, each device will have a MAC address and that is um, assigned by the manufacturer and quite often you can identify if you have the MAC address of something you can identify at least who the manufacturer is and sometimes the device by that um, they can also be spoofed so um, be a little bit careful of that somebody can you know put a different MAC address on one of their devices if they want to fool you uh, LAN is a local area network that's computers usually within the same building um, wide area network connects local area networks and then you'll see these numbers and letters quite often that are wireless standards 802.11 um, a b g n and a c um, they go through and um, they've been getting progressively faster and more sophisticated and we won't go into a lot more detail on that but you'll see um, you'll see those a lot of times on routers and on devices as far as which um, standard they support um, thing to remember on those is that generally devices that run the newer standards are also backward compatible so if you buy a router today it's probably going to be an 802.11 AC but you can run an older device that um, uses G or N on that and it will work but it won't go up to the top speeds it won't take advantage of all of the um, all the things that you can do on an AC network but um, it will it will run just fine um, I looked for quite a while for a diagram that I could lift off the internet that was Creative Commons <laughs> and you know there's all kinds but um, I had a hard time finding one that I liked so this one kind of did the job it's old <laughs> you know? um, they have an, an old-fashioned you know iPod on there Woo <laughs> that was pretty exciting um, but anyway it gives you an idea as to kind of what a basic home network looks like and so you know this could be like a really basic kind of library network for a very small library as well okay at the center here you know you have a router um, the router is connected to a modem which connects to the internet in this case there's also a firewall and I lost my little pointer there's also a firewall that um, is between it is between the modem and the internet because you know you want to try to protect your network as early as possible to keep bad guys doing horrible things off of your network and then from the router there's a wired section um, and so you may have printers you may have desktops in this case there's a fax machine um, if you have any servers um, those would all probably be part of the wired network and then there's also um, items that are on the wireless part of the network so um, here they have an iPod um, laptops you know laptops can be wired into the um, network usually they're 
they're changing that, especially Apple's making that more and more of a challenge all the time. Um, but um, you can run um, desktops off the wireless, um, tablets will be off the wireless. There can be any number of the new internet of things type things will all almost always be um, wireless on there. And so, um, you know, you'll have like two different kinds of networks going on at the same time. Any questions on this really basic network before we move on? And let me unmute everybody. So your microphones are all working for questions. And I was just looking at this thinking, first of all, the classic iPod. Is really isn't, cool. that, isn't that just lovely? Yeah. <laughs> I've still got one of those. Yeah, my husband has one too, and he just, lo he just loves it. He has to buy, buy them now on like eBay, but when he's, he had one break recently. But I, I think what's, what's really interesting about this home network, you know, idea with the modems and is that it's a, the firewall, because I think sometimes the firewall kind of, doesn't it kind of come with a mod your modem? It's really software, right? It's not a yeah. piece yep. of hardware. And so. it probably doesn't come with the modem, but with the router. Okay, it's with the router. router. And every router has, you know, um, I'm not sure what it stands for, but um, every router has a NAT capability, um, which is, um, it is a way in, possibly somebody on here can explain this better than I can, but um, NAT has a way of acting like a firewall in and of itself. So you don't need to do any setup of all of any kind of software. Um, so there is protection just in having a router. Okay. And just, this is my, my question about this. So is there like kind of a natural, like, lifespan for a router? I mean, should you just always be replacing them every couple of years or is it, I that's mean, a, I think. That's a very good question. And <laughs> we're, we're leading into the next slide. Oh, so okay. That one off for just a sec. All right. Hold on a second. I'm going to, I didn't hear anybody. Anyone else want to jump in with a question here before we go on? Okay, well, okay, let's move on. Um, the other the other caveat I would say before we move on from here is that um, you know you have this one modem, this one connection. All of these devices are sharing that bandwidth. So um, let's say you've got five um, staff and public PCs that are wired into into your network and you've got five patrons there with, um, you know, you've got like a 20 megabit connection and you've got five people, you know, five PCs wired in and you've got five people there on their laptops and smartphones and everything. Um, so you've got 10 people connected to your internet connection. You can expect that each one is then only getting about two megabits out of that connection. So that's one of the reasons that it's kind of useful to keep track of traffic on there. So you get an idea as to um, how much bandwidth each, you know, user is actually getting and how much they need perhaps. Um, so as far as routers, I'm saying it may be time to upgrade. And I recently did, um, I had an airport extreme which I like, I'm an Apple person, I confess. Um, and, you know, the Apple products are really dead simple to set up. Um, there's, there's negative things about that, but they're dead simple to set up. And, um, and they work, you know, easily. So I had it, but it's getting to be, I think, probably about four years old now. And I think they are still updating it, but, you know, Apple's not going to be making routers anymore. So, I thought, well, okay, it probably is time to look into getting another one. And I think really the key time to upgrade on these is when your router is no longer getting updates. Um, you know, these are like your first line of defense on the internet for most of us who don't have a physical 
um, uh, physical firewall out there. And um, they're getting attacked. Well, I wouldn't necessarily attacked, but um, hackers are um, looking for vulnerabilities on these all over the place. So um, if you've got like a five-year-old router that you're um, that the company is no longer providing updates for. Um, it's not if it will get hacked, it's a matter of when. Um, they will get in and they will um, have access to your network at some point or another. And if, if you want, if there's, this is really a problem and you wanna talk about alternatives, we can do that offline, but because um, there are some when we go in, Yvonne, we'll get to that a little bit. When we actually go in and we look at the um, we look at the routers and the settings, you can see the last time it was updated. Um, and, and let me just jump in here since the people viewing the recording can't can't see what's in the chat box. Yvonne asked, okay. "How do you know if your router is getting updates?" And then you answered the question that you know you're going to get into that. So mm -hmm. just, I'm just adding that in. Um, so anyway. Uh, the top one on here is the one that I selected, um, and it was on the basis of um, reviews by some of the tech people that um, I get my advice from, and 9to5Mac um, had a really nice review about people moving from Airport Extreme <laughs> to another router, and it's like, oh, that's me, that's me. Um, and they suggested the 2600, but I kind of figured that was overkill for me and my little network. so. I went with the older, slightly less powerful one on that. Um, but for those of you, you know, who are really in a budget frame of mind, I, mean, I didn't think 119 bucks was, you know, bad to spend on my network. Um, those of you who are really in the budget um, realm, I've also seen recommended highly the Asus RT that I have listed on there. That I think it was going for like about 60 some dollars on Amazon. So there are options out there. Um, some basics about your router, you know, keep it in a secure place. So even though um, it will probably, you know, if it's a wireless router, it will probably have the best coverage if you have it out in the middle of the library somewhere because, you know, therefore it can kind of reach all the little corners. Um, that's not a very secure place. You know, people can get at it and anything that they can get at physically is vulnerable. Um, so I think it's better if you can put it in an office that people don't have ready access to it. Um, but don't lock it in the cabinet because then the Wi-Fi signal doesn't get out. You know, you do want to have it so that the antennas can you know, reach out and send their signals out. Um, if it isn't a secure location, you can you know put a label on it with the username and password so that you know you'll be able to remind it. If it isn't terribly secure probably don't do that, put it with a, in a safe place with your other passwords, and then um, update again. Update, update, update. Um, when you're getting ready to um, put a new router on, um, can configure your networks, um, one of the places to start is IP config. And you can get into this in Windows by going to the command prompt and you just type in IP config and it gives you this information. And um, down at the bottom is what's really particularly useful for you and you want to jot down is the IP address. Um, that IP address is of the machine that you're using. And um, so that one's not as important, but the subnet mask and the default gateway is important for that. And your router will give you um, the address to use to get into it. Okay, once I got into my router, I logged in with my username and password. And... Um, it has a number of different options. Um, one of them, and I'm not, I'm showing you a screenshot rather than the actual router because I didn't particularly want to share my password and some of that with, and have it, you know, 
be kept for pros prosperity on Vimeo <laughs> so anybody could see it. And I'm, I probably will pat change it again at some point, but that's a pain in the butt for those of you who know that. Um, so um, this is kind of what it looks like when I go into the Wi-Fi settings on here. And it offers a feature called Smart Connect. And um, what Smart Connect does, uh, and Starla asked, is SonicWall considered a router? No, it's actually um, technically called an internet appliance. Um, so it provides a number of different things, but it's primarily a firewall. Um, but like I said, routers contain firewalls. So you will see a number of similar things depending on your router and how sophisticated it is, you will see similar things to what you see within a sonic wall. So um, some of the um, things, especially as far as traffic monitoring um, that you're seeing through my router, you can also see through a sonic wall. Um, anyway, back to Smart Connect. And um, so what Smart Connect does is it decides whether 2.5 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz is better for um, the device and, um, and offers a better experience as far as getting on the internet and also which channel is best. So it does this all automatically. Um, some people like to set that stuff up themselves and I'll show you in a second you know, when you might want to actually do that yourself. I kind of like things that are set automatically. Um, so I just go ahead and keep that on mine. Um, most most um, 2.4 gigahertz is a much more popular um, radio frequency. And it's used by a lot of things that aren't necessarily wireless, like your microwaves and stuff like that you use that. So there's potential for interference, but it, it reaches farther and it reaches through walls and that kind of thing. So there's advantages to it. Um, you also want to set a password at WPA2, which is the highest level that there is now. Um, and it doesn't have to be, I mean, depending on your usage for it, um, it may not have to be a really heavy duty, sophisticated password. Um, but you know, the better the password, the less likely it is that it's going to be cracked on there. And I think, let's look at my notes here. Is there anything else I wanted to say on that? Um, when we're talking about setting up the channels, and I mentioned there are within Within the five gigahertz realm, there are numerous separate channels. And so if you are going to do um, separate channels, you know, you'll go out of auto and you'll look at you know, which of the options you want to do on that. Um, certainly leave enable wireless radio checked on that because that's what allows people to get on the wireless. Um, for 2.4 gigahertz, there's only three non-overlapping channels. 1, 6, and 11. Um, so it's a good idea to choose one of those that you will see um, people using channels that do overlap. And that's generally not nice because you're infringing on somebody else's bandwidth. And how do you find out that kind of thing? Um, there are little devices out there. Um, some people call them wireless sniffers. Um, this is a Wi-Fi analyzer that I have on my Android phone. and um, it basically just looks and sees what wireless networks are out there. So this is my home network. It's on my, um, so these are um, people in my neighborhood. This is the five gigahertz setting. And you can see um, Domec is mine. And so it's very strong because we're only about three feet away from the router. Um, but you know, it takes up a little narrow thing, but it's a very strong um, signal. And some of my neighbors, you can see they're on higher channels and they're taking up wider um, expanses of bandwidth, but they're not interfering with mine at all. 
when you get into the 2.4, it's more crowded. Um, once again, um, here's mine. And you can see one of my neighbors is, you know, kind of sharing that with me. It doesn't look like it's a problem, though. Um, at least it hasn't been a problem thus far. Um, there's another one that's in um, kind of spanning over several. And then there's a couple others that are down there. So if I was having problems, I might choose to move down to the 11, um, um, 11 channel. But it's just kind of, it, I, and I think if you're in an area where there's really a whole lot of network activity going on and a lot of interference, um, it's probably more worthwhile, you know, keeping an eye on this kind of stuff than, um, than I do. Since I've got it set up for smart, it's going to be choosing which area I think it's good, is good. But kind of up to you as to how you want to do that. I just thought I saw another chat, but no, it was an old one. Um, there's also a thing on there called WPS. Um, turn that off. Um, that was something where you could manually connect devices to your routers and I don't see any purpose to that and it's one thing you really don't want to have people mucking around with your router anyway. Um, so guest networks. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on these because this is as deeply as we're going to get into sub networks at this point. Um, most new routers, newer, even my old um, airport extremes offered the option of guest networks. And I think these are really good both for libraries and for um, for home networks. Because um, the way I'm thinking about networking these days is um, in terms of trusted devices, um, maybe less trustworthy and totally untrustworthy, or you know, as many levels down there as you want to go. Um, but you know, on, and it's a little bit different with libraries than it is, you know, home or business because, you know, we used to assume on a home network that, you know, all of the computers and devices that we had on our home network were trustworthy, you know. Um, I mean, maybe not so if you have kids and you, you're not quite sure what they're doing with it, but, um, you know, You've got your computers, you've got your laptops, you've got your tablets, and um, you know, you're pretty sure they're not going to be doing stuff. You know, they're not going to be going places they shouldn't be going, you know, bringing in viruses and stuff to your network. Um, so, you know, you could allow them, you just needed one network and some basic security. It was to keep the bad guys out of your network rather than keeping people in your network from doing bad stuff and, and hurting it from within. Uh, but, you know, once you allow the public in, um, you know, you're, you're changing that dynamic entirely. So, um, or even, you know, if you're bringing friends in on, on your home network, um, you know, maybe you don't really want them to have access to your computer that you do your banking information on. I don't know what your friends are like. I don't want my friends into my banking. Um, so you can set up guest networks. And um, similar kind of thing, you know, you go ahead and name it, put a password on. This is the default one from um, my router. You know, I've changed it since. But a couple of things that you want to be aware of on this is one of the things that they offer on here, which is really useful, I think, is AP isolation. That's um, access point at isolation. So that means somebody who's logging on to my guest network using that password can't see anybody else on that network. Um, and you know, I kind of wish everybody who had public Wi-Fi available out there in the world um, did it that way as well. That you know, if we went on this. If you go to Starbucks, if you're logging on to you know, Wi-Fi on a plane, um, but they don't, they don't bother with that. Um, but you know, so people can see 
other people on the network and potentially get into their computers and do nasty things. You don't want that happening on your library network. Um, the only reason I could think that you would even think about not having that or the local network access unchecked, because um, local network access means that you're giving somebody who's logging on to the guest network um, the ability to access anything on your main network. Um, the only reason I would think that you would even question that is if you were doing things like wireless printing and you wanted to offer that, because um, that would get in the way. Um, they would not be able to see your um, wireless printer from their networks. Um, so I think that's something to consider, but I think, I mean, for me, it depends on your traffic and how much that kind of service is used by you. But um, I would think the inconvenience of having somebody have to, um, you know, log on to a library computer to do printing would be worth um, the security level of not having anybody. And we all know that library networks, people access from outside the building from their cars. Um, so you have no idea who they are. Um, but you know, those unknown people um, for not having access to everybody else on that network and as well as your library network. Um, let's stop again for questions on guest networks because this is kind of, I think this is kind of crucial. And again, I've unmuted everybody's microphones, so you can, um, some of you have your microphones muted locally, so you'll have to unmute them again there in order to speak. But any questions? So when you when you're talking about when you're showing I just wanted to clarify but when you're showing these screenshots these are from your computer here. These are from my router. Oh. But so but so your but how do you your router doesn't have a screen. Um so you logged I into your router. I access my router through my computer. Right. Yeah. I just that's the piece I wanted to mm -hmm. to get in. And and um and so you know you get into like a control panel right. on the router. And so yeah, this is what you see. And We're going way basic now, but I just yeah. thought we we uh, well, maybe is, ought to cover that. So yeah, you go into the control panel section of your computer, and you'll see wireless devices, and, and your router and will be awesome. there. And there's often a couple of different ways of doing this too. I mean, um, mine is the most basic where, you know, the computer is wired into, you know, this is a wired connection. You know, the computer is wired into the router. And so it's, it's directly. Um, I also have an app so I could, you know, get into this um, through my, through an app on like my iPad and mm -hmm. do modifications that way. And, you know, it's set up so that I have to be on the same network. I have to be on my home network to do it. Right. Which is another, like, little security thing. Um, you can also have it set up if you um, have somebody who is remotely taking care of your networking, where, you know, they can have access from anywhere. A lot of libraries do that. Yeah. Exactly. You know, so, you know, I know libraries in the West, for example, who hired Jim Semeroth mm -hmm. to take care of their networks. You know, he logs in using, you know, presumably using an app, and then he can log into their routers and see what's going on anywhere. And, you know, that's always something to consider, too. I mean, you don't have to have somebody right in the library doing that. But I think it's helpful, you know, like Janine was saying, you know, that, you know, um, somebody else set up and she didn't really know anything about it. Um, I kind of regard a lot of this stuff, even though I'm not an expert in this, um, and I like to dink around with it until I break it. <laughs> you know, it's basically how I work with this stuff. But um, the, I, I call it the dinking around method of learning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but you know, it, I kind of regard this a lot like I do car stuff. You know. I like to know enough about it so that I have some idea what's going on. Like, you know, if, if I really needed to do in-depth stuff, you know, I would most likely, most likely have to hire somebody to do it. But when they start rattling off things at me, um, 
I like to be able to have something register in there that I have some idea as to what they're talking about. So it's like, okay, that is what I want to do, or at least I know where to go to look for more information to see if that's what I want to do. So I'm not completely at their mercy, um, you know, because they can tell you anything. Yeah. Well, yes, you need a you know, convoluter, you know, extreme, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you know some of the basics, then you kind of go, okay, I, you know, I have an idea as to what they're talking about, and maybe that is what I want to do. Um, but no questions on guest networks? Not seeing anything come in. Okay. Hold on. I'm going to just mute everybody and unmute you once again. So we're ready. Okay. Um, a few more things on um, setting up networks. Uh, like I said, you can have static or fixed IP addresses. Um, you can also have dynamically assigned IP addresses. And so most um, routers will also come with a DHCP server, which means they will dynamically assign um, addresses to devices as they come on the network, as they log in. Because um, everybody needs to have one of these numbers in order to function on the network. Um, now, um, you may want to actually, you can choose to just let all of them get randomly assigned um, for DHCP. You know, that's what I did for a long time. And um, it basically works okay. Um, I think for things that, that other devices need to access, like printers, and stuff. Um, I think it really makes sense to have them have static IP addresses. Um, those of you who are on things like Montana Shared Network, um, like Montana Shared Catalog, excuse me, I'm getting confused with Montana Library Network and you know, these old things that we've had in the past. Um, but, you know, you will have um, computers with dedicated IP addresses um, because something that's being hit on a routine basis, it helps if it stays in the same place with the same address. Um, so most of us are gonna have some kind of mixed things here. Um, so, you know, I would say computers that you have on your network that are stationary, um, printers that are stationary, um, other devices that don't come and go, they just stay there. Um, you may want to consider assigning an IP address to them. Um, things that come and go, and certainly guest network is that, you know, you're not going to have any control over, you know, things that come and go on that. Um, but laptops, tablets, things like that, they come and go. Um, you want those to be DHCP because you don't want to have to change the settings every time you you know, move it from place to place to use it someplace else. Um, now, what you can do to kind of compromise on that, you don't want to give the same device, you don't want to give two different devices the same address because that confuses things. Um, so it helps if you can kind of map out, um, you know, who gets what addresses. And basically you have um, 254 addresses to work with. Um, so you can start, you know, you can say the DHCP server, I mean, I decided for my network that the DHCP server, you know, should have like less than 50 addresses to assign randomly. So the first one is already taken by the router. So I'm setting up um, that the DHCP server can have access to numbers two to 50 that it can assign to anything that comes on to my network. And I will keep the ones 51 and above that I can assign as fixed addresses. So um, like I took my iMac, which is in another room, it's still on wireless, but I assigned it an IP address. Um, I've taken my streaming devices, um, 
like my TiVo, my Apple TV. <laughs> I've got a lot of these. Um, and I assigned those IP addresses, you know, because they're not moving anywhere. Um, and I could probably do more on that if I wanted, but um, this, even though um, this is this is my work computer, it's a laptop, it usually stays here. So, you know, it could go either way, but I'll leave it dynamic um, because I do you know, take it to the, to the state library every now and then, or I do take it on the road. Um, so, you know, I'll let the DHCP server uh, assign an address to that occasionally. Now, um, things that do have dynamic addresses, you don't want them to keep those addresses forever because I've only got um, like 49 of those available. If everybody who ever comes onto this network keeps the address, it's gonna get full on them. So there is an address lease time, which in this case, this was the default on my router. So I went, hmm, okay. I guess that's okay. I did go and check it out and see that 86,400 is um, 24 hours. So that seemed reasonable. Um, so each device that you know connects on um, can have an address that it can keep for 24 hours and then it gives it up again. So it comes on again, it'll get another address. Um, the DNS settings you can leave um, as is for default, or um, you can set them to the DNS server of your choice. In this case, 8.8.8.8 is Google, and 208.67.220.220 is OpenDNS. So I just like those, so I use those. Doesn't make any difference. If you leave it as default, it's going to use your um, your internet service providers um, DNS. And the DNS is something I probably could have put in there. That's um, where it converts the addresses that you type in, um, like google.com to Google's IP address. And so they keep track of all of those and, um, and do that conversion for you. So you don't have to remember you know, 192.168.1.1 for everything you go. So that's a good thing. And so I like Google do it because Google already knows everything about me and is logging all my information. So they might as well have that as well. Uh, now a little bit about reports. Um, when you log in and you access reports, um, there's a lot of different things available and you can choose to get daily reports, weekly reports, monthly reports, whatever. Um, I do weekly and um, these are just a couple of the ones. There's more that comes up than this, but um, I just thought these were kind of interesting to look at a little bit, um, just to kind of get an idea as to the usage going on, the bandwidth, um, uploads are usually going to be much lower than downloads um, because most of us are not creating a lot of content and sending it out there. Um, the, the download surprised me a little bit. Um, I didn't realize that I was going through like 2.4 gigs. I ran another report where there was like seven gigs download and that kind of stuff until you know I realized that um, you know this is my home network. Um, I like watching Netflix and um, PBS shows and um, things like that. I don't have a cable TV subscription, so I, um, I stream content off the internet and that stuff really adds up. Um, if I had a data cap, I'd really want him to be keeping track of that because um, you, know, you can hit those data caps pretty, pretty quickly with streaming video. And if any of you have data caps on your usage for your libraries, um, it is worth going in and having a look at what's going on with this kind of stuff. Um, one of the things with the destination overviews, um, it also keeps track of domains. They're visited a lot. Um, 
you know, if you want to look for things that are, you know, potential problems, um, this was one that came up to me and I thought was kind of interesting. This, um, my top domain for the time that I did this was this q.livechatinc.com. And I thought, what in the world is that? I had no idea what that was. Um, and so it's like, why is that coming up for them? Well, so I went and you know, went to that and discovered it was a live chat thing and why that was coming up so frequently, 6,476 visits was, I've been kind of doing like online shopping, looking at RVs, you know, my fantasy thing. I want a little van converted RV. And every time you, I go to one of those RV sales sites, little live chat thing pops up, you know, hi, I'm Sarah, can I help you? Hi, I'm, I'm Diane, can I help you? You know, and I exit out and then, you know, it pops up again and again and again. And, um, I love your I love your voice interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, City. I, I'm sure I'm not the only one giggling, but so but, that's yeah. what it was. It was yeah, it's this exactly. it's this little bot that those yep. things are. Oh, hmm. yep, yeah, um, yeah, and extremely annoying and logging tons and tons of visits to that domain. Um, but it, it could have been something more nefarious. I mean, this one was easily explained. Um, you know, application categories, you know, that 2.1 gigs miscellaneous. Um, I'm pretty sure that is um, like Netflix, something like that coming on. Um, you can see social networks, networks, um, file transfers. Uh, those of you, I think file transfers is something I would look at, um, especially those of you who have DMCA issues. If you've got really high, um, rates in that file transfer category, people are probably um, using your network for BitTorrent and um, other things like that, but you know, that would show up in here under applications. Um, a little bit so more. Just, I mean, just to let you know, we're getting close to the top of the hour, yep. so, okay. Yep, um, a little bit more on reports. Once again, we have upload, um, download traffic, and these are done by um, devices. And so for those ones that I've named, it shows up on there. Um, for other ones, you see it by the MAC address. So you would see the MAC address of users who were coming into the library and were um, actually, I mean, you can do show all and you can see what everybody's doing, but um, it's not totally anonymous. Um, so I think those who are concerned about privacy, I don't think I'd be hanging on to these records forever, but um, it's useful as far as knowing what's going on, on um, what kind of traffic is being generated. Um, briefly, for those who are interested in SIPA um, compliance or just um, protecting children's you know, computers and that kind of stuff, SonicWall has this too, and um, routers may have an option to do web filtering on there. And they have several different um, options to do that. You can totally customize as to what you want to have access to. If you want to have a kid's computer that is really safe and only have it access a couple of websites, and then have um, games on there that you know, you've loaded on, there's that option. You can block access to known malicious sites. You're letting them decide what are the known malicious sites. Um, to known malicious sites and adult sites is the one that you can't see underneath with the red one. Um, this, and Aaron asked what, um, what router it was I was talking about. This is a Synology that's, that's doing this one. Um, one of the reasons it's recommended is this has really nice user, user interface. Um, and then down at the bottom, you can customize. If you choose to customize, this is the little thing that pops up that allows you to select which categories you want to do. SIPA compliance only requires adult um, to be. Um, but you're letting them decide what is adult and whether that um, meets the criteria of visual depictions that are um, obscene or child pornography. Now, there is also um, a block page thing that you can almost see behind there where you can set up a block page. I tried doing that and I tried running the filter. 
um, you can customize your block page. So I thought, put a little message up that says, you know, the site you're visiting has been blocked, you know, um, in accordance with SIPA, with Children's Internet Protection Act. Contact a staff member um, if you feel this is an error, or you, you would like it unblocked, which, you know, I, which I think you really should do if you're going to be doing filtering in public libraries. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get that to work. Instead, what came up was this weird thing that said, um, uh, what was the thing? It said, my connection might not be private and attackers might be trying to steal my private information. It's like, okay, that's alarming. Um, I don't think that would encourage me to seek help to get it unblocked. Um, so I didn't play around with it a lot, but um, be cautious. Um, once again, in the network setting, another thing you can do that might be useful is um, you can set speeds for various devices, and you can set priorities. Um, so, you know, this is my home network. I want my streaming devices to have priority, so I set those for high priority. Um, if you're on a library network, you might want um, your library computers your library staff computers to have higher priority. You might want your shared catalog computer to have high priority. Um, anything that you use for webinars um, to have higher priority. So you can um, you can assign them the top priority so they will get bandwidth before um, other folks. Um, I think that's really good. You can also throttle people at this point, but. Um, that isn't necessarily a nice thing to do, but can be done. I wanted to see if you could um, time out guest networks or throttle guest networks. I couldn't figure out how to do that through my router. Um, possibly through a sonic wall, you might be able to do that kind of stuff to kind of control what's going on after hours on that. But um, you know, these are things to look into. Um, Maybe, maybe not. You know, at some point, we can have discussions about the ethics of this sort of thing. But I just wanted to show you what some of the options were. So um, I did leave you a couple minutes for questions or comments. And also, um, I did link um, some useful things onto uh, the Montana Bibliotheki blog under um, Wi-Fi networking options. So if you want to go and view some of the videos that I viewed for setting up routers, um, setting up networks, doing some interesting kind of sub-networking things, go there. And I have unmuted everybody's mic, so we can certainly have a, if someone has something to add. I'm, um, this is a great time too, and I'm going to keep our recording going because we might have some good ones. Oh, here's a comment. I'd like to know what brand of router she's using too. So would you say that one more time or maybe go back to that slide where you showed it? Yeah, let's see. Come on. No, I, I am, of course, impressed that you have a TiVo, an Apple TV, and a Roku. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm not judging. <laughs> yeah. There it is. How geeky is that? Okay. All the way back. There we go. Yeah, that's helpful. So it's a Synology, and you chose the one, one, let's list one that's listed for $119 here on Amazon. Yep. So. Yep. And and like I said, I did because you know it it's gotten really good ratings from other people for the usability. And coming from a Mac, I was a bit concerned about being able to go in and do this stuff. And when I saw people saying, "Oh, well, this you know, yeah, somebody from a Mac," and there's a lot of stuff that I I'm not using that is beyond my capabilities. But um, you know, somebody who knows what they're doing could probably actually use it too. I didn't realize that you could. Um assign one of your devices like some a fixed space on your router and I bet my husband knows that but because he used to be a network guy but I didn't realize that that was good good to know and it looked like it was pretty easy like you said the user interface to kind of go navigate around and well and for my networking devices my Roku is really old so it won't allow me to assign an, um, an IP address but that's the one I would really like to be able to do it because you know right now I'm accessing it with my um, with an app on my phone and so it almost always has to go through finding it over again 
Yeah. yeah. Because the way I have it set up, it drops its IP address every day. And so then they have to find each other and reconnect. And it's like, hi, how are you? <laughs> I've never met you before. It's like, yes, you have. <laughs> but, but yeah, I should probably bite the bullet and get a new one or something. For, but, well, hey. you know, that's, that's really, that is interesting because then you, having a new IP address can affect your device in other ways because if you go to some place where you have a login and you have a new IP address, it can, um, out on the internet, it can, they can go, you know, we, we, a new device, you know, we occasionally get these notices, right? A new device is just logged into yep. and you're like, well, it was the same old device, but it looks different to um, the receiver because it's got a new IP address. I hadn't really thought about that. That's, and, that makes sense now. <laughs> as, as a cautionary tale, I mean, mostly what, you know, I'm trying to help people with is you know library basic library networking, but for home networks, the big concern at this point is Internet of Things devices and adding those on, and wanting to keep those separate from you know your computers um, that you're doing banking on and all this other kinds of, because those are kind of thought of as inherently insecure. Yeah, because you know you have no idea who's making them and whether they're updating firmware or whatever, especially when you're buying the cheaper stuff. So, you know, your light bulbs, um, your refrigerator, whatever, you know, you might have that you're buying that's a smart device. Um, you don't want it to be able to access your, you know, your home network. So, you know, you want to keep those isolated so they can't do any damage. And, you know, it's like, it's a whole new world as far as keeping, you know, getting more complicated all the day well i'm going to go ahead and stop our right thank you suzanne so much we're getting a lot of thank yous posted in the chat box this is really helpful and, and thanks for buying the new router so you could walk us through that whole process <laughs> <laughs>